Okay, I'm Ed Peterson, and I'm going to read today. I don't care if this uh, camera angle's bad or cuts off my head or whatever, because that's really not the point. Uh, I was so moved. Everybody knows I love my Norwegian writers, my Norwegian authors, and Norwegian literature, but I was so moved by this passage, these two pages by Lars Sabe Christensen's The Half-Brother, which is an award-winning book, that I had to read just these two pages and post it up on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, what have you. The only backstory I'll give you is the old one that you're going to hear about on these two pages. She was a former silent film star in her native Denmark before she married and moved to Norway and had a family. And Vera is her granddaughter who was raped by a soldier uh, on the final day of the war as the Nazis were being chased out of Norway uh, after victory in Europe. It's unclear whether it was a German soldier or a Norwegian soldier. They don't say it was a soldier. And all we know is that he had one finger missing. So I'm going to read you page 100 and page 101, and hopefully you get as much out of it as I did. One afternoon in January in the new year of 1946, the old ones sitting up on Blossom, the highest part of Sten Park, looking out over the silent city. It makes her feel at peace to sit there. This is her place. She can see the fjord lying gray and heavy beneath the cold fog piling over Ekeberg. The Christmas trees are on the balconies with the remains of decorations hanging from their dry brown branches. The old one is sorrowful and afraid. Vera has still not said a word and she's carrying a child she can no longer conceal. It's an insanity which is driving them all quietly mad. Boletta, her mother, lies awake at night and is losing weight unable to forgive herself for letting Vera go along to the drying loft. And every day Vera stands in front of the mirror, her head bowed, unable to look at herself. Soon she will have to have two mirrors. Who was it who broke in on her that day of rejoicing? The old one doesn't know. She only knows this, he who did this, he who is the father of this child, he had his way, he ripped up and he destroyed. He brought the darkness down over Vera and deserves nothing more than even greater pain and an even greater darkness. But she says it again in her inmost being. We have to take good care of this child. Because the old one knows all about grief. Sorrow is the old one's strength. That is what sustains her. It's her storm, her fulcrum. She will teach Vera to carry sorrow like triumph and pain like a bouquet which will burst into flower each night. But at that moment she hears footsteps in the snow and she doesn't need to turn around because she already knows who it will be. And she thinks to herself, I am neither sorrowful nor afraid. I am old and wise. And who else was there to be that old and wise and brave if not her? The old one smiles as Vera sits down beside her and waits a long while before saying anything. They're both equally quiet and accept, and accept one another's silence. I'm sure you haven't come here to talk, the old one says at last, but you can come here to me just the same. Vera lays her head against her shoulder. The old one trembles for a moment. She remembers a the time they'd been filming for three whole days and 18 scenes had been done. The film's title was The Chambermaid and the New Guest. They'd even built a studio on a piece of ground outside Copenhagen, and her eyes were burning after all those hours in the strong light. But she felt good, for this was going to be a success, a sensation. They were sure of it, and each one of them felt good, from the person in charge of the clapperboard to the director, from the pianist to the hero. Then they'd heard a shout from the, from the photographer, and all at once he began crying. He had forgotten to put film in his camera. It wasn't possible. It couldn't be. And yet it happened. All was in vain. Each and every glance and movement forgotten, disappeared as if it had never been, as if everything which wasn't imprinted on a roll of film was untrue, unreal, nothing. 
The director got up, just stood where he was, then sat down again and buried his head in his hands. No one dared say a word. And the old one, who was young then, beautiful and sought after, she was the only one who dared speak. We'll just do it again, she said. But it didn't work. It couldn't be done again. They had to find something else, a new title, a new story. And regardless of what they did, they always compared it with that which hadn't been filmed. And they were always dissatisfied. They could never improve on that which wasn't there. That was the end, the old one thinks now, and she shivers again. The best film wasn't just silent, it was invisible too. She'd like to tell Vera about it, but she says something else because maybe she's told the same story before and essentially it's a sad one. I don't know what you're thinking, even if you don't say anything, Vera. That's what it means to be deaf. I only hear thoughts and dreams in the beatings of hearts. Thanks for listening to my little reading of Lars Sabi Christensen's The Half-Brother. Maybe that passage strikes me so hard because sometimes that's the way music is too, that if you don't record it, it's gone in an instant and floats away in the air. And it either was or wasn't, but the only people who know about it were the ones who were there. It's Ed Pedersen signing off.